Good morning, everyone. My name is Nathan Putnam, and I'm the Director of Metadata Quality at OCLC, and I'd like to welcome you to the OCLC Link Data Roundtable session. Um, our agenda for today, so we'll do a quick um, welcoming, or I just did the welcoming. I'm going to talk a little bit about our entity management infrastructure. Um, this is the Mellon grant that OCLC received. I want to give you some brief highlights and how you might become involved in that. And then we'll get into our stories from the front. We have three speakers today that will talk about various linked data projects at their organizations. Um, but first, the entity management infrastructure um, that you may have heard about. We did quite a bit of an announcement blitz uh, when we received this grant. Um, OCLC received a two-year, $2.436 million grant, which is also being matched by OCLC to basically build an entity infrastructure um, within linked data. Um, the initial project is going to be a production infrastructure for works and persons. Those are the entities that we're going to focus on. And there will be support for multiple descriptive and encoding standards. Of course, there will be the use of persistent identifiers. But most importantly, with this particular collaboration, as with many of ours in the past, is a community engagement um, around youth, uh, all of us uh, who work within the, with library data. So what I want to highlight right here is how you might be uh, involved and pay attention to the v different projects that we're doing. And so we're looking for participants um, to provide feedback, test APIs, give information on what they'd like to do with data quality. Workflow creation will be inherently different from a mark-based, record-based cataloging. So, you know, what does that look like for you as you go through these things? Um, we do have several partners already lined up. We have a project advisory board that includes many OCLC uh, member libraries, about 10. Um, we're working very closely with the LD4P, the library, um, library data for production groups. Um, we also have uh, a relationship with the PCC, the Program for Cooperative Cataloging, we'll be working with them. And then the elect directors of technical services at large research institutions, also known as big heads. Um, and then there's the possibility for you. So if you are interested in participating in uh, any feedback as we um, call for volunteers or various things like that, uh, you can sign up for this by emailing uh, linkeddata at OCLC.com. There's a team of us that are on that listserv that will respond to your message um, so that you, you can stay informed as to what we're doing. Um, if you're just interested in being informed, we, of course, will be giving lots of highlights at the various ALAs and our, on our listservs and in the community center. So um, feel free to also kind of lurk there if that's more your um, interests. Uh, we do have the Mellon Grant uh, news announcement also posted on our website, so you can go to oc.lc slash Mellon Grant, um, Mellon Dash Grant, and to read the, um, the announcement that has a little bit more information on there. Tomorrow at the Library of Congress Bib Frame update, I will be going into a little bit more of the details of the Mellon Grant and the work that we have planned. That's at 1 o'clock tomorrow in the Nutter Theater, which is just right over here, so if you're interested in um, hearing more about this and seeing a couple of those slides again, um, please join us tomorrow at 1 o'clock. And with that, I would like to introduce our speakers for today. Um, our first speaker is Sarah Horowitz. She is the curator of rare books and manuscripts and head of the Quaker and Special Collections at Haverford College, where she works to integrate rare materials into student learning and collaborates extensively with the digital scholarship team. Her research interests include primary source literacy and pedagogy and image text interaction. Sarah is going to speak about the Beyond Penn's Treaty, a digital project which incorporates linked data, markup, and collections from Haverford and Swarthmore Colleges. Next, we have Honor Moody, who is a metadata creation manager in the Harvard Library Information and Technical Services Unit and serves on the PCC Standing Committee on Standards as the RBMS liaison to CCDA and as the RDA examples editor. Honor started editing Wikidata after discovering that the Authority Toolkit would slurp up, format, uh, slurp up and format Wikidata descriptions for use in NACO records and is strongly in favor of increased collaboration between Wikidata and the cultural heritage communities. Honor will provide an overview and current activities of the LD4 Wikidata Affinity Group, a group whose goal is to bring together anyone interested in discussing Wikidata related to topics and projects for libraries and cultural heritage organizations. 
Last, we have Kevin Ford, a librarian linked data technologist specialist at the Library of Congress, where he also worked from 2010 to 2014 in the Network Development and Mark Standards Office. He currently works on BibFrame, focusing recently on how best to bring efficiency to the library's BibFrame data set for the purposes of scale. Previously at the Library of Congress, Kevin was a key member of the original LC group developing Library's Bibliographic Framework Initiative and was also the project manager for the Library of Congress's Link Data Services. Kevin will discuss the most recent BibFrame activities at the Library of Congress. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Sarah. All right, can you hear me in the back? Great, I'm just gonna check my time. Good morning, it's a pleasure to be here. I wanna thank Nathan for inviting me to be part of this conversation. And I also wanna open by thanking and acknowledging the um, work of my colleagues, Meg Zarefanidis, Havford's Head of Digital Scholarship, and Emily Ticey Wong, our metadata librarian, um, who are major collaborators on the project I'll be talking about today. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about a project called Beyond Pen's Treaty. That's the link there if you wanna check it out sometime. Um, this is a project that brings together primary source documents about Quaker encounters with indigenous peoples in the 1790s and early 1800s. These are all manuscript materials held in the special collections of Haverford and Swarthmore Colleges. Um, the site itself is built on Django, um, and I'm happy to discuss tech specs later, um, but I'm not gonna do it, a lot of it now. Um, we run a number of projects on this um, platform, so it's, it's something that we're familiar with. It's flexible and easily adaptable. It's built in Python, which is what our students learn in intro CS, so there's a lot of in-house expertise. Um, so there's, there's a number of different uh, materials in the collection. Um, this is a linked data project, but it also really ultimately started in some ways as a digitization project. Um, and it ended up being that the two things went together for this project, but obviously they don't have to. Because um, when we were working on Beyond Penn's Treaty, we really ended up defining digitization not as um, the scanning and creation of images, but as the process of um, transcribing and encoding the materials that w would become part of this corpus. You can see an example of what that encoding with the um, sort of identifiers looks like here. Um, so we really try to think at Haverford very expansively about how we consider digitization so that it can mean not just creating an image of a manuscript, but actually something that has a value added component um, and in this case, it was really the encoding that was an important part of the project for us. That was what would enable the linked data piece of this project. Um, and it was really what would enable us to answer the questions that we wanted to when we started this project. Right? So that we had questions about information that the encoding allowed us to make visible um, in a way that we wouldn't have been able to do if we just put a bunch of images up into our digital asset management system. So the linked data is supported by this encoding process. Um, we're not really using um, sort of open linked data and um, sort of um, RDF triples and VF links and things like that for various reasons, um, some of which I'll go into. Um, we have a sort of homegrown persistent identifier system. You can see an excerpt of the very large spreadsheet here. Um, we Really, we're working um, with a corpus of data that doesn't have a sort of existing um, set of vocabularies, um, which was one of the difficulties that we encountered as we were um, approaching the project. Um, and we really decided that we wanted to incorporate this linked data piece because of the materials that were found in the corpus. Um, we didn't necessarily set out to say, we're gonna do a linked data project, let's see how that works. We started with this question we had about the fact that we knew at our two institutions we had a lot of overlapping materials where people, places, and organizations could be traced throughout those, um, where we had overlapping creators or creators who would serve as subjects in other materials um, across multiple collections, right? And that we were sort of dealing with an already existing network, but that wasn't necessarily visible in the manuscripts themselves um, or in the description that was already available of them, right? Um, so we selected um, the entities and the categories, which were people, organizations, and places based on the materials that we were reading and what we were seeing as part of the encoding process. Um, and we thought a lot about how these things could all be linked together. Um, right, so for instance, um, 
you know, a person can be a member of an organization um, or um, they, we can have a geographic identity associated with a birthplace or something like that. And so we were really interested in questions around like, how are these connections that we know are there going to manifest in a sort of linked data environment? Um, and we were particularly excited about the fact that this linked data environment would allow for new methods of exploration for researchers. Right? There's a way in which you can move through these documents very differently than you can if you're sitting in the reading room turning the pages of an individual document where you have you know, one item out at a time, one box, right? and you may actually be moving among different institutions. Having this digital linked data project embeds the linkages and the connections within the materials, allowing researchers to start with the networks rather than sort of encountering them um, almost by chance during their reading. Um, it also allows um, us to trace networks that don't necessarily show up in finding aids because they're at a much more granular level, um, right? Um, and I think there's a lot of potential for added visualizations and other things of interest, right? So this is a, a, a map that we created um, based on the geographical, we tracked, um, a lot of this involves travel, so we tracked locations where people said they were writing from, which allowed us to map routes and to see how people were taking same routes or different routes um, or how routes sort of change over time. I think it's also really interesting because linked data has allowed us to provide um, a different kind of context, right? I think we often talk a lot when we digitize special collections materials about what kind of context is lost if you don't encounter the source in its original place in the collection with the context that that provides. And there's definitely a loss there, but I think there's also other things that you can provide in this environment, right? We're providing a different kind of context in our entity um, descriptions on the site where you can get biographical or historical information often about some of the people involved. Um, you can sort of trace someone's mention through a wide variety of texts, which is a sort of different kind of, um, of context. And we're really um, sort of making these connections visible in a way that I think is hard sometimes to see in other places. Um, I often talk about it when I'm talking with people as a way of sort of um, uh, really growing the idea. I, those of you who are sort of familiar with with finding needs um, will probably th think about maybe the the related collections field, right? And and often you know that's that's a hard thing to think about. But I feel like this is a way of doing that at a much more granular level. Like how are these collections really related, and what how are these people talking to and about one another? Um, and the linked data piece of this project really allowed us to make that obvious and help to sort of pull it up front. Um, one other thing that I think is sort of unique about this project is the involvement of students. Because both Hadford and Smothmore are all undergraduate liberal arts institutions, we, rely, we have small staffs. We rely heavily on student workers who obviously aren't necessarily familiar with a lot of controlled vocabulary, um, which is one reason we made some of the decisions that we did as part of our work. Right? But we also are very committed to making sure that projects have pedagogical and skill based um, pieces for all of the people who are working on them, right? That's really important to us. We want to make sure that the work of all of our students is acknowledged, that they come out with some sort of project that they can, portfolio project that they can put on their resume, that they can talk about in job interviews, right? We want to make sure that any work that they do on the back end is visible on the front end. And, and we give them um, sort of opportunities, right? There's a, um, in this case of this project, there was an opportunity to engage really deeply with original primary sources through the transcription. There were opportunities for students to learn new skills like TEI encoding um, or working with linked data. Um, and there were, I think, often really interesting opportunities for STEM and humanities students to do work that they might not otherwise get to do. Right? We had project students working on this project who came from a wide variety of majors across both colleges. Um, STEM students don't often get a lot of time to be able to spend in special collections, depending on the coursework that they're taking. Um, so this was an opportunity for them to do some of that work. We also had opportunities for humanities students to learn some tech skills that they might not get if they're in, in the classroom experience. Um, so going forward, we're thinking about a couple of different things. Um, we're probably going to do a big rebuild of the site over the summer, and so we're thinking about what that looks like, how we want the site to look and feel, as well as sort of the possibilities around um, sort of uh, making the linked data model more compatible. What would that look like? What resources would it take? 
So thank you very much. Um, I think there'll be time for questions later, but I'm also always available here if you have questions or want to learn more about the project. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> And thanks for being here. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about the linked data for production LD4 Wikidata Affinity Group. Um, I am a member of the Affinity Group, and I am also involved with Linked Data for Production 2 grant at Harvard as a Harvard employee. Um, I'm going to I just said a lot of LD4s. I will explain them all, I swear. Um, and I will even try to actually use them appropriately as I continue through the talk. Um, so LD4P2 is an, the latest in a series of Andrew W. Mellon Foundation funded projects designed to build a pathway to implementation for linked data descriptions of library resources. The current grant has the partner institutions that are listed on this slide, as well as a variety of PCC cohort institutions who applied for subgrants uh, within the grants. And the um, primary goal of this or sort of the is the Synopia, the BibFrame editor, and it does involve a QA service that is a lookup service for um, external sources of linked data, including Wikidata. So what is Wikidata? For those of you who don't know, it is a free, collaborative, multilingual, and open knowledge base. It is also a central store for structured data of Wikimedia projects like Wikipedia and Wikimedia, Wikimedia Commons, and it is both me machine and human read-writable. It can also be linked with other linked open data sets on the web and exported in standard for formats and is increasingly serving as an identifier hub for a variety of vocabularies, both available um, published as uh, linked data and those that are not. Um, and I should say that Wikidata, for those of you who don't know, is seven years old and it was originally developed to fulfill the use case of <clears throat> updating um, current events rapidly across the different language Wikipedias. So for example, death dates of notable people or changes in government leadership. So for example, there's not just the English language Wikipedia, the variety of um, language Wikipedias. Some of them have very small numbers of active editors like Catalan and updating the death dates on pages for notable figures was very burdensome. So they wanted a way to do structured data that then would push out and update elsewhere. So, you know, stop me if that sounds familiar. Um, there, so several of the cohort members and the partners specified Wikidata as an area of interest within their grant proposals. So the, um, <clears throat> this is sort of an embedded aspect, and one of the, some of the questions we're trying to answer are, how do we integrate library metadata with Wikidata to make it part of our cataloging workflows? Um, how, can we, how can Wikidata help us improve our library discovery environment? Um, and so the Google Knowledge Box relies heavily on Wikidata, and I think that linked data can do a lot more for discovery than just knowledge boxes, but that is certainly a very powerful tool in discovery to help contextualize library resources. So what else could we do with that? Um, Wiki, and there's also questions about how Wikidata can help us reveal relationships um, and connections both within our own da bibliographic data but also across external resources. Um, and there are ways that our current data structures don't really allow us to do. Um, and as libraries, we often have quite a bit of entity description within the metadata that we have now. So how can we sort of feed that back into Wikidata to enhance maybe gaps that are there? So this is very much a sort of reciprocal relationship where, you know, there's kind of not, you can go in at any point and get to the other. So then, what is LD4? Well, LD4 is an informal organizational framework for continued community collaboration to ensure an open space to exchange ideas and share information. Um, and essentially what that means is that the grant is doing a lot of work that may not be strictly related to the deliverables, so how do we keep that work and make it useful for the future. In addition, because so many of the cohort and partners are um, academic research libraries, how do we expand the pathway of, implement, of implementation beyond just those institutions and ensure that we are creating a pathway to implementation for all libraries um, and even maybe other kinds of cultural heritage organizations. So then, what is the LD4 Wikidata affinity group within that? Um, well, currently, um, it is what well, was originally started to um, discuss the various 
um, grant-specific aspects of Wikidata, but it very quickly became much more than that. Um, and it's currently chaired by Hilary Thorsen, the Wikimedian in Residence with the LD4P2 project, and I should note the author of these slides, a fact for which we should all be very grateful. Um, and I can't actually say enough good about Hillary. I think she's done a really fantastic job in um, shepherding the Wikidata Affinity Group into sort of what it is now. She has, um, it meets bi-weekly and she's consistently arranged for high quality content and a variety of speakers. Um, and if anybody has ever done any kind of content organization on a regular basis, that is a really hard thing to do. Um, and I, the other thing that I really appreciate about the Wikidata Affinity Groups it, uh, calls is that they really reflect, I think, sort of the best spirit of the Wikimedia conferences, where you have both people who are relative newcomers and people who are really renowned, sort of like the rock stars of the Wikidata glam world, um, sort of all in the same room talking and kind of moving forward together. And that's a really great experience. Um, anyone is welcome to join the group, and I will talk about how to do that in a little bit later. Um, so the goals of the uh, LD4 Wikidata Affinity Group are basically to provide a welcoming, collaborative, and supportive space to discuss Wikidata-related topics while helping newcomers gain a basic understanding of Wikidata in the context of the Wiki community and its norms. And it's important to remember that the Wikidata community is an established community. It does have its own norms and practices that sometimes differ from the library, cultural heritage um, sort of background uh, standards and norms, and we don't want to impose our values on them. We are coming to them as partners and equals, not as know-it-alls. Um, so an additional goal is to develop an inventory of competencies and technologies that comprise a foundational skill set for use both in Wikidata and other linked data work. Um, and sort of the core to doing this is the discussion and documentation of what is needed to implement and integrate uh, library and archival metadata in Wikidata at scale. So currently we have a lot of pilot projects. How do we take what we're learning from these pilot projects and really turn that into a production level process? Um, and the discussion and documentation is, you'll hear that theme again and again. Um, we are also trying to encourage a variety of institutions and projects to participate. Again, this is to sort of hopefully uh, account for some of the blinders that the um, heavy, um, you know, sort of the heavy emphasis on academic research libraries within the grant um, have so that we can, again, as I said, make this a broader, more useful pathway to implementation for more kinds of institutions. And we are also documenting and sharing the work that we are doing with the Wikidata community, both to get feedback from the community to ensure that our goals are in alignment with their goals, but also so that they can reuse our work if it's useful to them. There are certainly many areas that we have in common where we have problems uh, that we all need to solve. So how to participate, there are a variety of methods that are listed on this screen. Um, I do think that the public meeting notes in the Google Drive are the best place to start. Um, you can, the, the notes are quite well done. Uh, you can see who has been participating. Um, and then you can also decide what meetings you might want to go watch the recordings of, because there's a lot of them. We've been meeting bi-weekly. Um, there are also Wikidata working hours. There were actually some held here yesterday. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend. I understand it was kind of a mix of support for one lib, one ref work, as well as Wikidata. And I believe they had seven editors according to their metrics, which doesn't mean, might not account for all of them, um, who were there working on Wikidata. So some of the topics that have been covered are Wikidata related, such as the notability policy and communication channels, or as they say in the Wikidata community, meta. Um, and then also references, um, so technical aspects, how to add them, what are best practices, and merging, the merging of items in Wikidata. I know you will be shocked, absolutely shocked, to learn that they sometimes have duplicates. Um, the uh, tools that are, have been discussed include Cradle, which is a form that provides the properties most likely to be used with certain entities, so actors or monuments. And then OpenRefine, which is a powerful tool in its own right, but that has some built-in um, methods of converting your messy data into Wikidata statements. 
Um, the various projects, I've talked about some of them already. There's Finding GLAMs, um, which is, I think, amongst the most interesting. GLAM in Wikidata speak is Galleries, Libraries, Archives, and Museum, and is a shorthand for cultural heritage institutions. And Finding GLAMs is, I would say, the Wikidata equivalent of the um, Wikidata Affinity Group, or maybe even what the Wikidata Affinity Group might aspire to. And their focus is on not only describing cultural heritage institutions around the world, but not just making a catalog, but engaging them in the con contributing their resources, their, um, their information back into Wikidata as partners. And then in turn, using that within the various Wikimedia projects. So for example, digital images that can be of portraits, say, from museums that could be then used as illustrations within a Wikipedia article or, um, you know, uh, uh, resources that could be used to cite sources for the support of articles that are written. Um, among the projects that I find are most interesting actually is the Wikibase and the German National Library. The European libraries are very interested in Wikibase as a I mean, there are a lot of them, but many of them. Um, but the German National Library is particularly interested in using Wikibase as a linked data storage for authority data. So some future topics. Um, you may or may not be able to read all the text on the screen, but if you can, you may see that some of them were on the previous slide, and that is because those topics are large and important and cannot be covered in a one-hour session. Um, I actually, uh, I had, hadn't even heard of integrality until I was, saw this slide, so I think there's an endless number of tools within the larger Wikidata ecosystem that are of different interest, and so it's important to have this opportunity to kind of see them all or to sort of learn about new ones and have a structured way to do that because we don't always. Um, there are the ways to get involved. There are the um, ways to participate that I also mentioned. I want to add two. One is to add any Wikidata projects that you yourself are working on um, to the practical Wikidata for Librarians Wiki project. This is also a place to store the skills and competencies that I mentioned earlier. I think this is very much inspired by the library carpentries. And finally, they are actively seeking submissions on Wikidata related proposals to the LD4 conference on linked data in libraries um, that will be held in May at Texas A&M. There is a January 31st University, so you need to get back to your hotel and get cracking on that. Um, and that is it for me. So thank you all for your attention. Good morning. Uh, I was invited today uh, to provide a, a kind of an update of what we've been doing at LC, at the Library of Congress, with BibFrame. So I thought I would come in and provide a BibFrame update. It is not the BibFrame update. The authoritative one is tomorrow at one o'clock. <clears throat> so I've been, so in putting this together, I was thinking, you know, what, you know, what have we been working on since ALA annual? I and mean, we tend to have these updates every six months, so let's do it, base it on that. And the three that I really want to talk about are at the top, BibFrame to Mark, the pilot um, and BibFrame editor work that we've been doing, and a little bit about hubs, although I'll focus largely on that middle one our expansion of the pilot project within the Library of Congress and uh, changes we've made to the, to the BibFrame editor as a, re as a response from cataloger feedback. But during this time, we've also participated, we've also made updates to Mark to BibFrame conversion. We've participated in a couple of the LD4P2 meetings that Honor um, talked about and the European BibFrame workshop. But in the interest of getting to the, to the meat here, just to say a couple more words about the, uh, the quick items, the mark to bib frame work that we've done, that the work on that conversion has been relatively minor. Uh, we're limited mostly to small fixes such as bugs, other tiny things that we wanted to integrate sooner rather than later that in fact ha ha had a impacts the conversion from bib frame to mark. Our participations in the LD4P um, project is largely to provide you know, any type of support that we can with respect to our authority data at id.loc.gov, but we get to sit in on the meetings and hear what all the cohorts are doing. And one of the, some of the themes and focus, focus that, one of the themes and focus that came out of those meetings is their, the work and the focus that the cohorts have been putting toward cataloging and Synopia and authority integration. And I pulled that out uh, in thinking about this project, in, in no small part because that was a, been a lot uh, has been 
much of our focus for the last six months internally as we've expanded the pilot. But one other thing I did want to note is that a small group in LD4P among many groups in LD4P, but one small group is actually actively working on exploring discovery, which is very much a, a topic that's coming to the fore as we start to have some real bib frame and originally created bib frame data coming out of the out of various projects, out of our pilot, out of Synopia, um, for example. The European bib frame workshop, which we also had the opportunity to attend, the the conversation there was still somewhat model-based, um, whereas here in the LD4P groups and in the US, they, it tends to be a little more integration-based. But one of the really fascinating things that uh, that came to the, our attention when we were at the European Bitframe workshop was talking with some of our peers at the National Library of Sweden about their system. So the National Library of Sweden has, uh, has a fully linked data system. They they store the data as RDF or as linked data. They catalog as linked data. They are capable of taking in a mark record and converting it into their internal linked data system. And they're capable of taking that internal data and producing a mark record format. But because they are actively working in a linked data environment, it was really fascinating to talk to them about their experience so we could trade notes and somewhat um, relieving to see that some of their trouble spots or pain points are the same as ours um, also. So moving from there to the bib frame to Mark, I'm not going to say anything much about this whatsoever. I'm going to leave that largely, largely to Jody tomorrow, who will be discussing this at the update um, to, uh, between 1 and 2 tomorrow in the Nutter Theater, as mentioned by Nathan a, a moment ago. But I will give you a preview slide of about some of the things that she'll talk about and the examples that she'll show. We do have a first cut. We can produce mark records. We have loaded a handful of them into our, our ILS. Uh, it will change. It's going to be an iterative process. But some of the ideas that we're introducing right now, again, time will tell what works, what doesn't work, is we'll have more URIs in our data for the dollar zero that's coming that we're acquiring through the linked data process. We've taken out the 007 altogether and moved most of that information down to more 3XX fields. We're going to have a general 008, which is to say that the common bytes will still be retained, such as languages and dates, but the format-specific bytes um, won't be there. All genre form terms in fields are, are going to be in six, field 655. A lot of this reduction and why genre form terms was called out here has to do with reducing the duplication we have in MARC. Um, one of the things that's really come out from the MARC to bib frame conversion and we've had to work with once it's all in bib frame and now we're working with as it goes back into MARC is the duplication or the redundancy that you have in MARC. So you have information in the 008 that might also be represented in a, in a 3XX field or an 007 in a 3XX field. When we could pr we could run the, a mark record through the bib frame conversion and come out with three or four genre forms um, from the process. And no 880 fields. But I'll stop right there and hand it over to, to Jody tomorrow. But do attend. You'll see examples and should go into greater detail um, about this. Which brings me to the, the one that is largely I get to talk about here at at this meeting is the pilot, our expansion of the pilot and changes we've made to the LC bid frame editor as a result of that expansion. So this fall we added 57 more catalogers. Those include at least 10 new catalogers from non-book media areas such as sound recording. 10 new catalogers from the field offices so we have people in Cairo, Jakarta, Islamabad and Nairobi working in the bid frame editor now. And we trained local and remote pilot participants um, in July and August. That brings the total of current cataloger, um, catalogers in the pilot up to 107. And that's been, uh, that's been great. It's been great to see the additional activity receive the additional feedback. One of the things that we do internally is we, ho we host a monthly all catalogers meeting. Not every cataloger has shown up for a variety of different reasons, vacation, the day that it falls on, who knows why. 
Um, but we take this, we, we put an hour and a half aside and invite everyone to do it in order to communicate project updates, changes that we're thinking about, ideas that we're thinking about, and also to take the opportunity to demonstrate changes we've made to the editor of the database usually changes that we've made to the editor and database as a result of the previous meeting that we had with the catalogers. And we use it, we use this moment to really elicit some feedback. Um, and I, they, I really enjoy these meetings. Not everyone does. Um, I have thick skin. I don't mind being on the pointy end of a catalogger stick. But when we sit through these meetings and we get that feedback, it's hugely beneficial to expose what might we do differently? How could we do something differently? What we might need to think about and also prioritize our work. So when we have one cataloger in one division complain about something and another cataloger in a different division complain about the same exact thing and then a third cataloger in yet another division, all of whom are in different divisions and therefore probably not communicating much with each other, complain about the exact same thing, that helps us realize that this is a, a wider issue and prioritize it higher. And from those meetings in the last six months, three themes really emerged. One, using the mouse is unsatisfactory. Um, more on screen, more, put more on the screen, show more on the screen and, you, and less clutter. And inputting diacritics, diacritics used in transliteration in the browser is difficult. Now, I'm not going to say that we've solved all of these or any of these or solved them completely, um, but we've taken a whack at some of them, uh, but they've really become up to the fore. So changes that we have made to the catalog to improve the catalog experience has to do with reducing the white space so there's more on screen and shortens the mouse movements. So we shortened labels where we could. We shortened the space in between buttons where we could. Again, these tiny, you know, when you when catalogers count things in terms of keystrokes, we're hoping that these little tiny things might might help too. Well, one of the things that's interesting is we actually still have relationship designator right there. We could probably go in there and remove the word designator in an interest of, of uh, succinctness. More reliance on lookups. Um, this can reduce clicking and typing. So before, if you had to enter a form of work, for example, you had to click a button, it would pop up a modal, you then had to move the, mo the mouse into that field, and you would start typing and you would receive a, a, a drop down list of possible options. We found a way to uh, reduce that, those steps and just place the type ahead field on the main screen so there, to reduce that clicking um, for catalogers. When working in MARC, you have one MARC record and it's unambiguous what you're working on in many respects. But with BibFrame, you might be working on a work or an instance or an item and not knowing and so context matters, and, and one of the things that the catalogers were, were saying was that it was sometimes unclear where they were. They wanted to be able to have a quick glance of being able to see where they were. So we actually added border colors when, depending on what they were working on. So green if, it was a, if it's a work, blue if it's an instance, or yellow, orange, whatever color we want to call that, if it's, if it's an item. Suggest service made searchable by code, not just label. So, so type aheads and, and suggest services the world over tend to be predicated on the idea that you're typing in an actual label um, and you get a drop down list of possible options that conform with whatever you're typing in. But one of the things that we have, of course, are catalogers who are extremely familiar with the codes and not as much the labels associated with the codes. So it's more natural, for example, for the cataloger to enter CAU when trying to enter or identify California from the country's code list versus typing in CALIF. So one of the things that we did, again, very tiny things, but, what, but we hope all of these small things add up to something meaningful, is we, of course, made the, we made the suggest service now amenable to typing in a code and still getting to the same place that, you want, that, we, that we all want to get to. Mouse over suggests drop down context info. We actually added context info um, to the system probably prior to ALA annual, but we've since augmented it um, a little bit, so I figured I'd point it out in, in this setting. But it, the drop down context info provides more contextual, info reducing, uh, more contextual info reducing leaps to external systems. So what I mean by this, and 
I know it's a little small here, but I was trying to make sure both of these were on the same screen, is examples of this. So in the bottom right one, you can see that Johann Sebastian Bach is highlighted, and just to the left of that, you can see variants and the sources from which that, that name was found. That's the type of contextual information I'm talking about. It helps the cataloger determine whether or not that is the sort of Johann Sebastian Bach that the cataloger wants to associate with that work and saves the cataloger the trouble of having to jump out to an, a different system in order to search those names and find that information out. On the top left is an, just an example from LCSH. The term that's highlighted is glass art. And on the left-hand side, you can we, we show the broader terms and the narrower terms to help you either decide that's the one you want or maybe you want a broader one or narrower one. So again, providing this contextual information to save you the trouble of having to jump outside of the, out of the editor system. Mostly for time reasons, I'm going to breeze past the next couple of slides. Uh, the, but one of the things that we uh, worked a little bit more on at LC are hubs. These were technically introduced into the system right before ALA annual, but they were not really discussed as part uh, at that moment in time. We spent more time discussing them and looking at them after after that. Uh, so I'm going to breeze over these slides quickly, but that's also in part because if you want any more information, I'll go into more depth about this tomorrow uh, during the Bibliographic Conceptual Models Interest Group between 2.30 and 3.30 here in the Convention Center next door. Hubs, we pursued, we pursued them because we were trying, we determined that we were trying to do too much with a BF work, that separating some of these things out would, would probably be helpful. We also realized there was no super good solution for title and name title of um, access points. And we also explored this a little bit because Cher VDE and Casalini had been working on the concept of a super work and we wanted to see if we to, we, if we approach this independently, if how close we would arrive at the same solution. And spoiler alert, mostly we do. Very quickly, the mark sources for hubs say a lot about their composition. They come from Mark Authority 1XX, so long as it's got a dollar T or Mark Authority 130, a 1XX plus 240 in the Mark Bib format, six. 100, 610, 611 with a dollar T, 700, 710, 711. Point being is they are access points and they're coming out of mark from fields that uh, expect the, the constructed title, which we often think is as uniform titles. Their composition, therefore, says a whole lot about their role. They are really designed as aggregators um, and collection points and access points. They they aren't necessarily a beginning point or an end point. They could be, I guess, but they're really designed as a waypoint. They help us connect things together inside the system in order to help uh, people discover things and, and make the correct links in the data. To see these in action, very quickly, this is um, Milton's Paradise Lost, and on the right-hand side, you can see all the individual works we have in the system for uh, Paradise Lost. We can also take this hub that you see on the left for Paradise Lost and link it to tr translations. We can take the hub on the left, which represents, again, this conceptual notion of Paradise Lost and identify the fact that it's part of these other two items we have in our collection. And we can see that this particular hub, this work, has been used as a subject of many, many, many other items that we have in our collection. And, and by many, you'll note that that list right there begins with, ends with AG, so it, it goes on a bit um, right there. And that brings me to the end, so thank you so much. That's what we've been doing the last six months.